I'm very grateful for for doing it, yeah. and I understand why God had me do it now, because it it affects my outlook on everything. I mean, completely changes my viewpoint, really from most people's viewpoints, and that's why He did it. I think it prepared me to be a missionary in a lot better sense, of not judging. Yeah, everything I learned. The way I look, stuff's different, and it is so I can go out and be a better missionary. Welcome to The Human Experience. I'm Jennifer Peterkin, and this is episode 36, Cody's Story. Cody is what he calls a missionary to missionaries. While he's been on this journey for more than a couple of years, Cody didn't start out as a missionary. As a paramedic for over a decade, Cody saw more than his fair share of trauma, and though he was making a difference, he was not. When his family encouraged him to go on a missions trip, that was the last thing he wanted to do. But after going, he realized his renewed purpose. Now, Cody works independently, helping small organizations, individual missionaries, and orphans. This episode was recorded in Brasov, Romania, where Cody was serving at the time. Please note that names have been changed in this episode to protect the identity of those involved. A brief content warning before we begin, this episode contains conversations around death, drug use, and trauma. You do work for missionaries. Yes. You are a missionary that helps other missionaries. Yes. Okay, so what does that mean? I explain it to people as some a missionary to missionaries Mm -hmm. and a missionary to orphanages. So God provides me with people that need help. And I go there. It's kind of like, that's how I came over to here even. Mm -hmm. I was in uh, Papua New Guinea as a missionary, but then with all the COVID stuff that was going on, I didn't make it back. So I was like, okay, God, where do you want me to Mm go? And he opened up Romania. I started checking other places, but none of those were, they were like, oh no, COVID, we're not sending anybody anywhere. So I was like, okay, uh, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want to send me? Because God doesn't care if there's COVID or not. When he sends you out, he sends you out. Sure. He always opens a way. And I was like, okay, so where am I going? And and my mom, it's a best friend in junior high, actually babysitted one of the missionaries that's over here. Oh, wow. And she, my mom's best friend's like, hey, I get you in contact with these people. Okay. I was like, okay. So I sent him an email. And then... When, we went through all the paperwork and stuff. You, know, you have to do background checks because they deal with children and whatnot. Sure. Because you got to make sure you got good people coming. And so we get through all that. And then I ended up over here in Romania. So I helped them do their some stuff, built a shed and some cabinets. And then my landlady was like, hey, we're putting a roof on an orphanage. Would you want to come help? I was like, well, yeah, that's right up my alley. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's what I'm supposed to do. So I started helping them put the roof on until my visa ran out. So how long have you been in Romania then? Oh, that one was three months. Last time was six months. And then this, my visa will run out in September. Okay. So you've been here for, well, over the course of a couple of years. Yeah, but technically probably a year together with just months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what happens when you, when your visa's up? I don't know. I have no idea. Well, what happened last time? Ah, well, last time I went home, I guess, well, the first time I was here and had the three-month visa, I was like, well, I'm done in Romania, which never tell God you're done with something. That's (laughs) That's just a joke. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) So it ran out, and I actually went to Austria to help with a church there. And then with the visas and stuff, it's like, oh, no, your visa's up. You'll have to pay a big fine if you don't get out of the country. So I got back to the States. Did a few months back home, and then I was like, okay, where are you want me to go now, God? Yeah. And he sent me back to here again, back to Romania. And I was like, okay. So I did the time last time, which is about six months, I would say. And got working on the roof again, helping out the people in the Roma village. But then I kind of felt like God was sending, telling me to go to another church, because I was going to the same church that the same people we have. And I was like, well, okay. I kind of felt that way the first time. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'm comfortable, God. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing you don't tell God. <laughs> so he sent me over to this other church, 
And when I got there, that turns out that's where, at the orphanage I'm helping, that's where some of those orphans go to church. And then there was another guy that that orphanage was helping, Mm -hmm. who's a missionary, and he goes to that church. And I was like, okay, God, that's probably why you're trying to get me to go over there, because of this missionary. And, well, I met him at the orphanage anyhow, but I'll get back to that other one, because that's (laughs) a neat kind of story. He needed to help building his house. So I was like, hey, that's what I do. I help missionaries build stuff. So then when I came back this time, that's what I did. Started helping him. But I just got back from Germany, as you know. Mm -hmm. And I was visiting uh, some of my friends that I met in Papua New Guinea. And they're doing work at a house for mission groups that come in. It doesn't matter. They don't have just one mission group. I mean, it's multiple. They come rent a house. Mm -hmm. And then, and it's when I say house, it's like big 200, 300 people can stay in it. Oh, wow. So they have convention stuff there. And I went to help them, and then they couldn't get the week off, so we couldn't, couldn't go see Germany, which is mm-hmm. all right. So just stayed there, helped them serve the other missionaries coming in. And the missionary that I'm helping here, which went to Germany, mm-hmm. and he, he gave offers, said, hey, I can give you a ride to Germany, drop you off wherever. But I was like, I already have my plane ticket spot. He went to the exact same house I was at for his, nah. yeah. <laughs> I was looking at the paper and I was like, oh, I know him. I'm helping to build his house. <laughs> and then I met another guy there and his brother's actually the pastor. One of the pastors here at the church I go to now. Okay. So, wow. But yeah, I thought that was kind of cool that I, I met the preacher's brother yeah. and then the missionary that I was there. But I'm finding out that's what God does. Mm. He... He has a very good sense of humor, and oh, he just he gives you an interesting life mm. if you just let go and let him take control. Yeah, if you're open to it. Yes, but it's kind of, you can't put stipulations. No, no. No, just, that's just true. Just go. Just let go. And learning to do that's pretty scary. Sure. You know, it's taking that first little baby step of faith, and then the next one, you kind of ease a little more out there. Mm-hmm. Because you're like, I don't know, good. <laughs> but pretty soon you do enough of them, then next thing you know, you're moving to the other side of the world with three bags and yeah. no worries. Even Absolutely. though you know nobody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that is what happens a lot of the time when you just open your mind and your heart and you just allow the doors to be open and to actually walk through them. So prior to Romania, you were in Papua New Guinea? Yes. Is that the that is that where you started this? A uh, full-time missionary. Okay. Yeah, I started there in October of 2019. Okay. So I got to spend the first year of the COVID in the wow. Papua New Guinea. What was that like? It was different. I went in there and it was, you know, the world was normal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then they started having COVID, but we didn't see anything. Mm. And all the my friends there, Papua New Guinea, everybody there, if you're not black, you're white and you're a missionary. And it's just okay. uh, how it is. And everybody there, either a white plus skin or a black plus skin, mm-hmm. is, is how they refer to everybody. I really love the country because it's not about race. Mm. It's just, that's what it is. And yeah. people move on. And they're like, well, none of us are getting it. It must just be a white person disease. And we're like, no, that's not how viruses work. Mm-hmm. But like I said, nobody was getting it. Or if they were, they weren't testing and... The ones that got it really never noticed mm. uh, because they have really bad pandemics there. <laughs> uh, right. Typhoid, uh, malaria, and I don't mean to downgrade COVID by no means, but yeah, whenever, but there's a lot of difference between uh, dengue fever, mm. you know, that type of stuff versus mm-hmm. what the majority of the people that had COVID's, you know, type of thing. But yeah, so that one was pretty interesting because then they shut everything down and then we got the... Uh, missionaries we gathered up everybody and then they actually rented a big plane and flew everybody out uh the missionaries that weren't going to stay because it was the last plane out of papua new guinea mm. and we had no idea when it was coming back again so that one that was a little strange sitting there watching sure. that jet leave knowing i don't know when i'm going to get home again but yeah so that was a little bit strange and then i worked in the clinic as a paramedic and we were expecting a huge death rate when it first came out, you know, and didn't see anything. So they cut me loose and let me go to the jungle uh, to go build houses. Okay. And uh, put in uh, solar systems for missionaries. 
So I went and got to do do that for the last bit. Uh, first eight months I was in the clinic. After that, I went out. Mm-hmm. How long did they stay shut down? About a year, roughly. I think they started coming back, well, I wouldn't say a year, six months mm-hmm. before the next plane came back. Okay. You knew the right people or had enough money sure. you could get in and out. But yeah. actual just airlines. Yeah was shut, I think, for six, seven months, something okay. like that. Yeah, it's a very strange time, especially for stuff like that, where things were just people were being shut down, locked out. It was, you know, a lot of us have never experienced anything like that before. Yeah, that one was strange. <laughs> you know, yeah, because I came out of there and then went to uh, Australia to get home. So I had to fly to Australia, but then it, since everything was still chaotic, I uh, then went from Australia to New Zealand to L.A. Okay. So I took a while to get home, and then I had to do a 12-hour layover because of the flights were very few flights. Mm. And that was so mind-blowing to me when I... Because I left, like I said, I got there, everything was normal. Mm-hmm. And then you go to that culture, and when you leave a culture after you've been in one for a while, you get reverse cultural shock. And I didn't know anything about that. I had mm. not a clue. Uh, especially in Papua New Guinea, everybody, all the women wear uh, Mary blouses. And so they hit, hit all the women mid-thigh because you can't uh, show your butt. Mm-hmm. And then I come to L.A. and 12 <laughs> hours, and I was just like, I knew leggings existed before I left. <laughs> But it was like just poof, you know. You never had noticed Never them noticed before. like yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, it was just like mind blowing to me after spending a year and then seeing that type of change. Well, and that was the first time you had been back to the States after COVID, too, right? Oh, like, yeah. So everything had changed in yeah. the States, like in a big way, by the time you got back. Yeah, for the most part. Where I live, it didn't. Going through the airports, everything was, it was everybody was with the masks. Mm-hmm. And I, I still don't understand that. Everything I learned in paramedic school was taught never put a mask on someone that's not sick. That's what I was always taught. And then mm-hmm. everyone's wearing a mask. I'm like, why? Mm. Hey, it still won't make sense to me. <laughs> I've, I've tried, to, especially the ones I have. But anyhow, that's yeah. something else. But. Yeah, so that was weird, doing that. And then I got to Dallas, and then people weren't wearing their mask like everyone else was. I was like, okay, yeah, it's getting more normal to me. I'm getting closer <laughs> to home. And where are you from? Kansas. Okay, okay. And then, so I sat in there talking to a lady, and she was from Oklahoma. And she didn't have her mask on. She was like, I don't understand this. <laughs> I was like, I don't either. I said, I've been in a jungle. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been a very divisive topic more than most things and it's lasted for years so oh, yeah. we're still still talking about it so why Papua New Guinea because God sent me there but That's, like how did that uh, happen what what brought you there in the first place well to start it off well I guess I was in EMS for oh first responder since 97 so that so I've been in EMS and fire for a very long time and I'd got out of church. I, I'm a prodigal son is what I am. I fell out of church and then I got back in. And it was probably about four years before I, before I actually became a full-time missionary when I got back into the church. And I sat in there one day and they had some missions going out into Mexico, about two hours north of Guatemala, actually, but part of Mexico it's in. And my little niece, well, she's not little anymore, <laughs> but she's like, Uncle, do you want to uh, go to do this mission? I was like, no, I want nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. Even though as a kid, I kind of knew I was supposed to be a missionary. I had that feeling growing up. But I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And mm-hmm. she kept going, come on, come on. I was like, no. And this went on for like two months because it was, you know, trying to get people to go. And then pretty soon my mom was like, I'll pay for it. Just go. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. I was like, fine. <laughs> so I did. Went down and I was like, oh, okay, maybe this isn't too bad of a thing. Yeah. You know, people are nice. It was uh, refreshing coming from EMS. So I was like, okay, yeah, that's pretty cool. And then kind of felt like God going, hey, you need to be a missionary. I was like, uh, maybe, <laughs> you know. So then the next year came around and it was like, I was going to the same place, and I was like, 
Well, okay. So I went and then I was like, okay, I'm a missionary now. Okay. So I accepted it on my on the way down. I was like, okay, I'm not gonna be a missionary. So did you go with a team? Uh with our church. We had okay. a, in our part. Yeah. Uh so I went down with that and then I was like, okay, when I come back I'll start trying to find a place to go with. And when I got back I started looking and I checked with everybody and well, I say everybody, I don't know. I mean, I checked with a lot of different outfits, and none of them were working. And it was like, hey, yeah, we interviewed, but then it didn't happen. And then interview didn't happen. Yeah. And then got in with uh, this one I went to Papua New Guinea with, and it was like a super highway. Just phew, all the doors flew open. Mm. And I was like, okay, because I'm learning when God wants you somewhere, he just opens up all your doors, and away you go. Uh, that's why I said it doesn't matter if COVID's are here or not. God wants you to go somewhere, you'll go. And that's what this was. So we opened up all the doors, went straight through. Uh, like I said, I was paramedic. And then I got on the field within six months. And they're like, that's never happened before. It only takes a year, year and a half to get your licenses, everything mm-hmm. like that. But they said, boom. Yeah. And it got me there just in time for COVID because all the other people were leaving most of our medical people all stayed, but they they were just needing somebody to come in and fill in other spots because I was a uh, you know carpenter okay. uh, that type of stuff. So I filled in a lot of spots that they the other guy had left and went home. <laughs> okay, so you didn't go there to be a medical missionary, sorta. Well, I thought, okay. <laughs> I thought when I went over, I was going to be more in construction, and then when they needed help us, right? EMS, the I mean medical i do medical Mm -hmm. i got there they thought i was there for medical and then i do occasional construction okay gotcha and that's how that happened so most of the first eight months i was all medical okay with a couple of uh, trips out for construction and this was with a specific organization Mm -hmm. it was with ethnos okay uh, 360 and are you still with them or are you independent i'm independent okay okay yeah no which uh, missionaries i really like the ethnos missionaries they're they're good people yeah and all, and then they, their actual purpose in Papua New Guinea is to go into the tribes, uh, learn the language, turn it into a written language, uh, teach them how to read and write in their language, and then translate the Bible into it. Okay. So they actually get the word of God in their own language, mm. which is really important because you start getting language barriers. And so, I mean, what they do is really important. Yeah. And all. So when did you decide to break with them and kind of do... Your own thing. Oh, uh, when I came home from Papua New Guinea. Okay. That's when I was like, ah, I can't go back there with all the COVID restrictions and everything. Because I was it's like, I, I can't in a good faith do what they want me to. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, the politicians. Yeah, the, the math, that whole thing. I just, it's wrong to me. So mm-hmm. I didn't do it. Okay. You know, well, that's, my community didn't do it. Mm-hmm. So I, <laughs> it's normal where I was at. No one ever, if you've seen someone in a mask, it's like, What's wrong with them? Mm. But if you want to wear one, wear one. I mm-hmm. don't care. It's your business, but. Yeah. So Romania was the next place that you came. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think it's very valuable what you do because there is a lot that, as you know, people working in the field, there's a lot of different aspects that they have to cover and there's almost never enough people or help oh, yeah. to, to do it. So the idea of, of just being somebody that supports them and, and wherever, whatever they're doing, like I, I've heard your name <laughs> as I've been here, <laughs> just like in all of the different things that you've been involved with. So yeah, like where did that idea come from to just like be a, be a support for missionaries in that way? When God said be a missionary, he's, he's be a missionary to missionaries. Mm. Uh, and, uh, Orphans. I mean, those are the two big ones he just laid on my heart. And then if you can't find those, then uh, churches. Okay. But that was really from the get-go. And when I went to Papua New Guinea, that's actually what I did there. Because it was in the clinic, we helped missionaries. Okay. And so they come in. They did get some citizens sometimes, but most of the time it was just set up for missionaries. So they could come in and get, get medical help because there's very little medical in that country sure so a lot of times if you had something broke a bone they would fly you to australia type of stuff oh wow so you'd have to do those and how far away is that fort mosby would have been two hours i think and okay. then another 
two, three hours. Wow. And yeah. all. So not close. Yeah, no. And it, it depends on if you're out in the jungle. No, it could be a long time. Yeah, yeah, and for all. sure. Because they had one guy fall off a roof and break his femur. And he stayed there all night until they could fly in and get him the next day. Wow. You know, because there's parts down there you can only fly in at certain times. Mm. Like I was in a village out in the jungle, and they could only fly in between 8 in the morning and 10. Okay. Because after that, the winds would come in, and you couldn't okay. couldn't fly in anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a weird place. <laughs> it's really neat. I miss it. I, I Good people. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, and you had such a heightened experience, too, being there through such a weird time in the world. <laughs> I think that really kind of accelerates your connection with a place yeah. and its people. So you were a paramedic. Yes. For years before you did this. And now you're doing construction. Mm -hmm. How did you get into construction? Uh, construction. I've always done construction since okay. I was a little kid. Was that like your dad or? Uh, it's because I have two older brothers and would tear stuff up and we'd have to fix it <laughs> before mom got home. Okay. Well, there you go. That's one way. <laughs> and if she didn't notice it, well, then we knew we did a good job. There you go. <laughs> or she was just being kind. One of the two. Yeah, my grandpa did some construction, but uh, most of us just grew up building stuff. When you're at, when you live on a farm and ranch, mm. I mean that's that's yeah. what you do. You yeah. just go out and build and whatnot. It's a necessity, mm -hmm. almost sure. That makes sense. So, why did you become a paramedic? Because God has a sense of humor. It's, <laughs> it's, that's that. Uh, I didn't want anything to do with EMS. Nothing. Really? No, I, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a fireman only. Okay. And I actually wanted to be a force fighter. I had to jump oh, out. wow. Yeah. But they don't have any of that in Kansas, so <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, so I, when I graduated school, I got my uh, I got into college just for normal house firefighting. Okay. So fire science is what I went and got my degree in. But yeah, I wanted nothing to do with EMS at all. I was being a house fire and come out and I see EMS sitting in the ambulance outside. And I'm like, what is wrong with those people? Mm. Why would you be out there when you could be in this burning house? <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> it, 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 it was just like, oh, why would you do that? So what is fire science in school? Uh, it's uh teaches you fire uh like legal class so you go in and learn all your fire code stuff like that okay then you'll go into construction and different ways of looking at buildings okay so whenever you go in like a lot of people they'll stick you in a room and they shut the door and they think they're locked in or whatnot no mm -hmm. uh, a wall is only a door that hasn't been opened uh, so is a floor so is a roof yeah but once you understand that house that's constructed then it's really not that big of a deal to knock a hole in the wall and walk through it but it's the getting the, the concept uh first fi house fire i was in we had a big uh part of the floor collapsed and we're trying to get around in and i was like well that's there and we can't you know walk into that room and then the fireman that i was with well he just you know knocked a hole in the wall and walked through and i was like oh yeah <laughs> You know, it's very obvious thinking about it. Yeah. But unless you actually do it firsthand. Sure. I mean, it. Well, it's very intimidating yeah. to be in that kind of situation and to know exactly what to do and what's still safe to do, I guess. That's why they don't let rookies by themselves. Yeah. They, they send them in with other people. That's good. <laughs> yes, it is. No, that's really interesting. My dad is a fire protection engineer. Okay. So he does all the codes, life safety, all of that. And he works for an uh, architectural firm and signs off as they in the different stages as they are building to make sure everything's up to code. And he was a volunteer fireman when he was in his early 20s. So when you're like, I went to school for fire science, I was like, I, I mean, I know what he did, but I had never heard that before. So that's very fascinating. So you went to school for fire science. You wanted to be a forest fighter, mm -hmm. firefighter. firefighter. So then how do you transition into being a paramedic? Well, I got done up there and I moved home. And then the fire department in Oklahoma was going to be hiring. So, And you, you knew a year in advance that they are going to be hiring. So you start putting in your applications. And 
And I was like, well, I got my two-year degree in fire science, but I really need to get a, my EMT because a lot of fire departments are going that way. And this is back in 01, or this is back in 2000, actually. And I was like, okay, I don't want anything to do with it, but if it can get me the job, then uh, I'll do it. So I started going to school, and I got my EMT, and I got done with it oh, right at the first of 01. I I don't know, Janet, or, you know, January, February, I went to boards, got my MT. But when I was there, I was actually working on ranch as a ranch hand. And that's how I was paying to go to school because there's no paid fire departments where I was at. Mm-hmm. It's all volunteer, which I'm still on that volunteer fire department. Oh, wow. And all. But so I was going to school, got that. And then I was filling up one night after I got home from the ranch, uh, the ranch I was working on and the ambulance drove up and the uh, director she got out and she said well you don't come pick up your pager i was like i don't want a pager i don't want nothing (laughs) to do with it and then she said don't make me talk to your mom yeah see i'm from a small town Uh i'm in a little bitty small town (laughs) she's like i will get your mom (laughs) i was like fine (laughs) and it was just it was paid volunteer so for like 16 12 hour shifts you got 200 dollars. wow yeah and i was like "Ooh, that's that's a lot of money (laughs) Yeah, not joking. <laughs> I <laughs> right, believe right? you. <laughs> <laughs> way back when, and there, yeah, ranch hands didn't get paid much. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was like, fine, I'll do it. And it'll get me some experience. So whenever I yeah. go down, you know, to get on the, try to get on the other fire department. So I was like, all right, so I'll get some experience, that type of stuff. And then we're going through it. And my first few months in EMS is really rough. Uh, my first six people that died on me, I knew since I was a little kid, you know, bus drivers, people I delivered medicine to, you know, that a small town. Yeah. And then uh, I remember finally it was my seventh person that died on me. Uh, I didn't know him. And I was like, thank you, God. Yeah. <laughs> I was like excited I didn't know somebody. But not in a mean way. I mean, I'm. Sorry for the, the no, lady. No, no, I, I completely understand. Yeah, but it was just such a relief not knowing them, and so I was like, "Ah, oh, I really don't like, I don't like this guy. It's not for me." And then one day we went out, and this was getting close to going down and testing for the fire department that I was trying to get on. This was like a month and a half before then, so. I went in on this call, and I said I was just an EMT, and then my paramedic I was with, was a, it was a diabetic call. And the husband came out, and they'd been married like 70 years. Wow. And he was just bawling, terrified. My wife's dying. My wife's dying. He's just crying. And so we go in. I got the suction, so I'm cleaning out the airway. And I'm nervous because, you know, I'm a brand-new EMT. I was like, oh, they're dying, that type of thing. And my paramedic, you know, been around forever. And they're just like, yeah, whatever. Just walking in and uh, started an IV, pushed D50, and boom, the lady woke up. Wow. Yeah, that's what D50 does. Now they're changing stuff now. That, that was, you know, a long time ago. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, they're starting to change exactly how, how do you start giving sugar because you don't want to wake them up that quick. Okay. Uh, so she woke up, and now this old guy – was now bawling because his wife's alive. Mm-hmm. And he's hugging on us, you know, snotting on us because, you know, he's just, oh, everything's flowing. I was like, okay, God, maybe this is cool. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can do this. Yeah. And so I got to thinking on it, and then, well, I made a deal with God. That's a, that's a dangerous thing to do. So I said, God, if you want me to be a paramedic, fine. You'll have to pay for everything, but I really want to be a fireman. So I don't know how to figure this out, so I'll do it this way. God, let me pass the physical, because at the time I was 22. I mean, I was in excellent shape, because you had to be able to run up 10 flights of stairs and back down carrying something in like two minutes. Okay. Yeah, so I I was in shape. So I was like, God, please let me uh, pass the physical, and then let me fill the written. Well, you can't outsmart God. (laughs) Because, you know, the written is don't be nothing. I have a college degree. I'm a, so <laughs> in it, you know, <laughs> yeah. that type of thing. And I'm sure God just laughed when I said it. But I said, okay, just let me fill the written. So, and if you do, then I know I'm supposed to be a paramedic. So the day of the test came, and I went past the physical, no problem. I mean, like I said, I was in excellent shape. And then went back and then took the test, like a week or two later. 
Uh, went in. It was the easiest test I'd ever taken in my whole entire life. <laughs> I, I mean, it was simple. An eighth grader education would pass this thing. It was, uh, if you have a gear turning this way, which way does this gear go? Which is the fastest way from point A to point B? I mean, it had nothing to do with uh, fire questions. Huh. Because all you have to have is a college, to, I mean, a high school diploma to get on mm-hmm. the fire department. So, I mean, I had none of, no technical questions, nothing to do with uh, fire rescue, bill. I mean, nothing. I was like, yeah, I'm like the second person done. I was like, going, okay, I'm going to be a fireman. <laughs> so, I went and I handed my test to the guy and he gr- graded it. And he stopped and he looked at me. And I'm smiling like an idiot because, you know, I know I made a hundred. And then he kind of looked at it again, looked at me. And then he took a different one because I guess he thought he graded it with the wrong uh, grading sheet. Mm-hmm. And then he graded it with that, the, the other one, and it was just as bad as the other one was. <laughs> I scored a 20. <gasps> I didn't just even kind of almost fill it. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, literally somebody, a fourth grader could score higher than a 20 on this test. I'm <laughs> just guessing I should have scored higher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he, the guy looked at me and said, man. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then I'm grinning like an idiot. And I know, and that's what he was like, oh, okay, there's something wrong with this guy. Because now I'm, I should have been upset. But instead, I was like excited because I'm going to be a paramedic. Yeah. But at the same time, if you can't pass that test, you sure couldn't pass any paramedic tests. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. <'cause I'm> like, <laughs> so I, I really see the humor in this. <laughs> So I I like, all right, God, I'm going to be a paramedic. So I left, went home. And on the way home, I was like, oh, God, you know, I'm just a cowboy. I only make $50 a day. I can't afford it. I don't have hard enough time for it and gas to go to class. You're not to pay for it all. Mm. I can't. But I told you I would go and do it. So I'm going. And went to class. Class started in two weeks. Went in. The first night, the teacher came out and said, we have a brand new scholarship pays 100% of everything, all your books, tuition, everything, the tests, everything, like you have to pay for your boards and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you have to get your uh, your shots if you don't have certain vaccinations type of thing. And you have to get drug tested to go in. So yeah, it pays 100% of everything. And we all applied. And then I came back in. Uh, two weeks later, she came in, walked up to me, shook my hand and said, congratulations, your college is paid for. Wow. And that's why I'm a paramedic. Okay. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> it's a long story, I know, and I'm sorry. No, but... no, don't apologize. Uh, that's a great story. So then what is the what is the schooling process to become a paramedic? Uh, first, you have to have your EMT. Okay. And then... Which is what... Sorry, uh, I, what is the difference? Well, you have your very basic ones. Well, they've changed everything since when I went through, but uh, you had your EMT basics, then you had EMTIs, and then you had paramedic... And then depending on what state they had other ones in there mixed in. But basically an EMT is your drives. <laughs> but for the most part. Uh, so they they just your basic first aid stuff. Okay. And then you go up into your advance now. It was IV, but it's advance for your EMTIs. Mm-hmm. And they will do, uh, depending on what state you're in, uh, IVs. They can push some drugs. They might innovate, a few things like that. And then you go up to your paramedic and... Then you do everything. RSI people, you know, paralyze them, innovate them. Mm -hmm. Uh, You actually shock. You don't use a machine to shock them. You actually start reading rhythms. Oh, uh, wow. Given all the the different medications for cardiac or anaphylactic or everything like that. Yeah. So by the time you were done with your schooling, what year was that? 2003 is when I finished paramedic school. Okay. With it. And you were a paramedic then until you went to Papua New Guinea? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. So that was a long time, like 15 years? Uh, As a paramedic, yeah, because it's uh, 2019, and I was paramedic in Papua New Guinea, so... Oh, well, yeah, so even longer. 17 years as a paramedic. Yeah. I'm still taking... I still got my licenses, but I haven't done anything since 2000. I mean, 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah, 2000 is when I started (laughs) (laughs) with EMS. Yeah. Well, yeah, because before you were... Doing, you were a full blown paramedic. You were EMT. doing right. Yeah, okay. as an EMT because it was two years back then. Okay. Well, I was twenty one months when my paramedic course took. Okay. With it, and when you came in, the teacher said, "Look left, look right, look behind, look in front. There'll be one of you." Mm. And she was right. Really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she did everything she possibly could to 
get everybody to pass. She wanted everybody to pass. It's just, yeah. if you're not that dedicated, you don't, you got thrown out. 80 and below is an F, or I guess 79 and below is an F. Wow. And you get one retake. Oh, and wow. And if you don't pass, you're gone. Well, I mean, you don't want someone. No, it's, it's, a, it's <laughs> good, but it's, yeah, that's a lot. So, so it's mostly people actually failing, not even just quitting. A lot of them, yeah. Yeah. And then other ones will quit because they're like, yeah, I just can't get it. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, so it's hard. It's hard school. It's a hard job. Hmm? Yeah. It I, is. And I feel like, I, I don't actually know this, but what is the retention rate for that job? Like how long does somebody usually do that job uh, for? Big cities, five to seven years is the lifespan of a paramedic. Yeah. Uh, and small towns, 10 years. Okay. And then they're done. Yeah. And you went well beyond that. Mm -hmm. Which most of them in my area do because it's you're taking care of your family and your friends. And, and that's that, the motivation. Yeah, that would be. Makes it hard, but it's why you keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And all. So did you ever get to be a firefighter? Yeah, because I'm on the fire department okay. where I'm at. Okay. So you did both. Mm -hmm. I had just a few of fire. I go out on car wrecks a lot more than fires. But yeah, I got to do a few. Okay. But yeah, so it's just mostly EMS yeah. is what it all was. It's kind of interesting that you really just stumbled into this. It wasn't it wasn't like a passion of yours. It was almost like a God. Yeah, well that, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so what did you like about it once you started doing it? What I know you said that it's you're taking care of people that you knew, which mm -hmm. was both difficult and rewarding. Mm -hmm. But what about the practicalities of the job did you enjoy, if any? Or what was it that made you stay for as long as you did? Probably the part I liked was, like I said, I got to help people that I knew. Yeah, that's the only reason why it, what made me stay. Most of it just makes you want to leave really quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not a good, fun job by no means. I'll make you very jaded and twisted, which is why I got away from church. And you'd think that'd be the exact opposite, except... Being a small town, or, and then I, even if I went to other towns to go to church, I ran the same problem. It was, if you're going to church because you're trying to fix yourself, or I say fix yourself, if you're trying to get help, you know, if you're actually there to say, God, help me, I, I need help, I can't do this on my own, then come to church, please. I'll come get you. But I had a lot of people that were showing up because then they could go stand in front of the judge and say, hey, I'm back in church, so, you know, have mercy on me. And I couldn't stomach that. I, it just, it just makes me fighting mad, actually. Yeah. Because I was actually on the sheriff's department for six years as a volunteer. I'd be a reserve deputy, so I'd go out on uh, drug raids with them, stuff like that as, you know, paramedic. But I'd be like, okay, I, I helped arrest you. <laughs> Yeah. Saturday night, you know, last Saturday, and now you're out of jail and you're out, you're here doing this. And if you're here for actually, because you want to get things right with Jesus, by all means, come, please. Mm -hmm. But they weren't. And then I'd have to go testify at court. And then the judge, I'd have to listen to him say that to the judge. And then I'd have to listen to him stand up in church and go, oh, praise Jesus. I'm getting better. And I'm just getting sicker in my stomach listening to it. And then some of them would go over and tell my mom, hey, we hate your son's guts because he arrested, you know, my son. Oh, wow. And I was like, well, don't do math. Math is bad. <laughs> it's, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. You know, smile if you don't think so. Oh, gosh. You know, they can't. There's no teeth. <laughs> so, I mean, I was having a hard time with church with all that because I was having to see those people on the ambulance and then go listen to him lie at church and then go hear it at court. And I'm like going, oh, I can't take this anymore, God. And so I started falling away. And then I go to some other church and, well, it doesn't matter where you're at. They're all in there doing the same thing. Or they're wanting, I call it God welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, they like show up to church. Hey, I can't pay my gas bill. I can't pay my light, my rent. Can you give me money? Mm -hmm. And they people just hand them money. And I'm like going... No, why don't you just go buy them their meth and then tell them to pay their own bill? That's what you're doing. Well, no, it's not. We're helping them out. I was like, no, you're enabling them. They need to either sleep on the street till they hit rock bottom or just go buy their meth for them. I mean, that's it's your choice here. And 
they finally started getting it to where I was going to church at. And I, that was one of the things that kind of got me back in was because I could go to church and not have to deal with that. But God had been dealing with me because, like I said, I was prodigal son. I went pretty dark the other direction with everything. That's really interesting, actually. When you said you fell away from church after being a paramedic, I was like, well, that's that's very clear. That's very obvious because of everything that you see and all of the, what I assume are just the ugliest things in humanity and, and the saddest things. It's I feel like it would be easy to, like, it would be logical to get mad about that, right? Like get mad at God about that. But that wasn't actually at all the reason. No, it has nothing to do with blood and guts. That doesn't bother me none. Okay. And all. I'm, I've seen a lot of it. Yeah. Now yeah, even friends and whatnot. But no, that doesn't mess with your medics. That's it's the druggies. It's the and meth seemed to be a very big issue well, where you were. Well, meth, uh, opiates. It's always been big, but it's that mindset. It's the ones that are the users, I guess. And I don't just mean welfare people. There's plenty of awesome welfare people. That there is. I, I know some really neat people. You know, mm-hmm. so don't take it that way. But it's just a lot of people like going oh, over your druggie, so you're on welfare, and, and it's that might no. It's this. You go up to the ones that have money, they have the exact same mindset as those other ones. Sure. I mean, they both are, think they're entitled, and that's what runs people out of EMS. It's dealing with those people. Those are the ones that'll sue you because, oh, well, you weren't nice enough to me, so mm-hmm. we're going to try suing you. And I, on both ends of it is where I've had issues, getting in fights with them because you won't give them drugs, and then they trying to get you in trouble because you're not giving them drugs. I'm like, well, if you want drugs, go somewhere else. And it's not going to be for me. Yeah, it's those ones. It's going in and dealing with people that kill their kids. You know, I've had to deal with that one where they laid on it because they didn't want to listen to it cry. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot went on that week. (laughs) But uh, Oh, geez. One week. Oh, that's just everywhere. All my friends all had to deal with the same thing. In their towns, that where they've had, you know, parents kill their kids, whether it's just because they ignored them, and because they went on meth trips, or, you know, just a lot of bad stuff that week was. Dealing with that type of stuff is what gets you. Mm-hmm. It's not like I said, the blood and guts and heart attacks. I mean that that all happens. Yeah. And all, but then dealing with that same people at church the next Sunday so they can try getting out of trouble. Mm -hmm. That's what ran me out of church. Yeah. Was that right there. So was it a God issue or was it a church issue then? Oh, it was every church I went to. I seen the same thing. Mm -hmm. It was a people issue. Yeah. But I mean, like it wasn't necessarily an anger with God. It was an anger with people. Yeah. People. Yeah. Yeah. I had no issue. I never got mad at God because of he let things happen as people say but i think that's interesting because i I think that's very human it's a very human condition to to go down that path right like well why why does this happen why are things so hard for some people so i also think it's interesting that you didn't go down that that thought path Uh, why do you think you didn't most people choose (laughs) the to be what they are so if they want to choose to be a druggie, so be it. I'm not don't blame God because you chose to be a bad person. Hmm. I mean, you have free will. <laughs> that's that's why bad things happen. It isn't because God lets them for to say He gave us all free will, and then we can choose to do what we want with it. Hmm. So yeah, that's why I never got mad at God. He lets you do what you want. Yeah, and all. I've had some that were really things that made me mad, but it never made me mad at him. I was just mad at the people. Yeah. You know, if you hurt your kid, I'm not mad at God because you hurt your kid. It's you I'm mad at. Sure. It's because of God's the reason why I don't beat you. (laughs) (laughs) Not joking. (laughs) That's why. Because Mm -hmm. I really want to. I mean, I, you don't touch a child. That's, that's no. Child abuse is wrong. (laughs) Yes. And they... Yeah, they just need a beat out of them. That's, then I know you go into that one and go, well, that could be just as wrong as the other one. But, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. But anyhow, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to just, you know, choke them. Because, oh, you want to, you want to hurt a kid? Let's, let's do it back to you. 
Yeah. But God says you can't do that. So. <laughs> well, yeah, that is against the rules. Yes. So that's what saved them. That's why I'm not in jail. <laughs> it's because of my faith in God. Well, there you go. Yeah. Do you think that was the hardest part of your job is having to watch all of these things and still be like still stay on this path of like, I know what I have to do. I just have to get the job done. Oh, I just went into paramedic mode, I guess is what you'd call it. I just, I did my job. Yeah, I see this. Okay, next call. Do I, And just kind of blank it out and then go home and drink it away. Mm. And all. Because when I first got in, that's what they gave me. They walked in, had some dead people. And like I said, my first six I knew. And they handed me bottles to take care of it. Wow. <laughs> so that's what I did. Don't recommend it. No. Yeah. No, but uh, I imagine that's quite common. Oh, it is. Yeah, EMS has a huge EMS police fire. We all have a huge uh, drinking, drug, divorce, suicide rates. Yeah. And all. Yeah, because I've had two partners or former partners that's committed suicide now. Oh, wow. And all. Yeah. Last one was three weeks ago. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so sorry. What do you think has kept you from that? Not just suicide, but... Oh, yeah, because I don't want it. Don't all want to of it. Yeah. Uh, well, keep me from wild drug abuse. I just know that's bad. That's I just never did. Yeah. Drinking's all I ever did. And that's... A lot of that drinking was... I was from small town, and it got to where you're working all the time, and the only time you didn't get to work is if you're drinking. Sure. <laughs> so I actually got to where I'd keep beer in the refrigerator just to pop it whenever I, the phone rang. Mm-hmm. So then they'd hear it pop, and they'd go, never mind. But yeah, so it's kind of how I got with that. It's good to get a good night of drinking in. Mm. And I know how bad that sounds, especially at missionary saying that. But it's still true. What it does is it gives it breaks your mind away from what's actually happening mm -hmm. at the moment. And so you kind of forget that, yeah, you just seen this really bad stuff. And so you just break and you start having fun with your friends and your brain's still working on it, even though it's a, you're not thinking about it, but it is working on it. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, a night or two of that, then you come back and deal with it. But it's just kind of taking a break from it and then going back to it. Yeah. I don't know if, how healthy that is for most people, but it worked for me. Hey, I mean, you kind of got to do what you got to do. So you've been away from it for a couple of years now. Yeah. I'm do starting you to like people. <laughs> Yeah, do you think about it often? Do you replay things in your mind? Not anymore. I used to. I used to have a lot of uh, flashbacks. You know, I, you'd hear, oh, flashbacks, you know, you'd see on TV and whatnot. And you're like, oh, that's a bunch of, you know, BS. As well, it was what I thought it was. You know, I was like, no, nope, that don't happen. That's just somebody wanting to be a wimp or try to get something. No, it's real. Yeah. <laughs> it is real. Oh, yeah. But it, until I experienced it, I would have told you, nah, they're just lying. They're full of it. But no, nope. uh, first one, I went out on a call, just a routine call, no big deal. A uh, guy just had a heart attack, fell against his house, and it was done. I mean, good way to go. I mean, when I go, I hope I go that way. Yeah. And then I was back, and I was eating with my family at the restaurant, and all of a sudden, I wasn't sitting in the restaurant anymore. And that was that dead guy, and I'm smelling everything, hearing everything, looking at him. And then I snapped back out of it, and I was like, what just, you know, yeah, happened? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So, yeah, I started having those. Those was about uh, five years in, five, six years in is when I really started seeing the ghosts mm -hmm. is the way that I, how I describe it. It was... You go down the any street, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I got a dead guy in that house, a dead woman there. Uh, yeah, someone died right here. You know, yeah. and it's just all this stuff, and it's all adding up. And everywhere I go, doesn't matter where I go, I see it all. And then flashbacks. I, my nephew, at the, he was real little at the time. He's like, where do you go? And I didn't even realize that he noticed that I just kind of, Checked out. Checked out. Wow. Yeah. I was like, oh. And because then I was like, well, places I don't want to. Mm -hmm. So when I told him, he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but 
So all this was going on, and I was like, oh, God, I can't take this anymore. I'm trying everything. I, I can't. You got to fix these issues. I can't take seeing the dead anymore like I was. Because, like I said, they were friends. They were people that, for the most part. And then the last one died on me was Big John. I call him Big John because he was almost seven foot. Wow. Massive. And yes, he actually did work in a coal mine for a little while. Oh my. <laughs> yes. So great humor in that. Well, he uh, had a heart attack. And we got him back and he, he just kept going. He actually had pulmonary embolism and what did him in. And he he's actually a neat guy. He just he just got to know the Lord three years before he died, and he goes to church with me, or he did. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, he he died, and he kept getting him back, kept getting him back, and then the last time he got back, he just reached and really just grabbed the hand and just wouldn't let go, and then he died, and then I mean again, I mean like we got you know flatlined that whole thing, but yeah, he finally we called it, and I was like, oh God, <laughs> you know, it's three weeks later, I'm like going like. I'm getting all this stuff. You got to do something about this. And so I had a dream, I guess. I don't know what you'd call it, if it was a dream or what. But that night I I was hurting really bad with all the stuff up there. I was like, God, you got to fix this. You, you just got to do it. And so I went to sleep, and then I woke up in a dream field. I mean, and the sun was on me. There's a nice tree. It was all bright. I mean, like, I say bright, but I mean, just very clear. I guess it, it wasn't a dream where it's kind of like, oh. Like fuzzy around the Yeah, no, I mean, this thing. is yeah. crystal clear. Everything is crystal clear. Had a light breeze. I felt the sun on my skin walking through the grass. And I came up to a ravine, and I looked down in the ravine, and I go to step down in there, and I kind of got cold feeling. And then it was like, you don't belong there. Get back up on top. So I... I didn't walk very far in, you know, but so then I turned around and walked back to the top. And I looked in the distance and a mist was coming, like this fog was rolling in. And it stopped at the bottom, right where I was headed. And all these figures started coming at me. And they all came out. And I started looking at them. And more were coming out and more were coming out and more was coming out. And I was looking at them all and, well, they all were my dead. They was all my ghosts. Wow. Every one of them. You know, just like how I found them. I mean, if they were ripped apart, that's what I seen. Or if they just died of a heart attack, that's what I seen. I seen them exactly how I saw them the last time. And then in the distance, this big figure was coming through. And it was like a foot taller than everybody else. Mm. Came out, came out, and it was Big John. And he came out and he said, he called me by name and said, Why'd I die? So I explained to him why he died. And then he said, we just want to thank you. Mm. I was like, you're welcome. Mm. And they all, and then there's still more figures in the mist I couldn't see. But then all these figures just all kind of looked at me, and then they all went back in. Mm. And then it rolled away, and I woke up. And I was like, whoa, what was that? I, to this day, I don't know if I could tell you if it was a dream, if it was vision. I, I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't uh, normal <laughs> by no means. But I learned later on that those the figures in the mist that I didn't see faces to, that was my future dead. And I put a lot more faces to those. But after that night, I never had a problem with the ghosts again. Wow. It was just... Came in, they said thank you, and that was it. That's pretty amazing. Oh, it was something. (laughs) But so I don't know what you'd call it or or anything about it, but that's what happened. I'd call it a miracle (laughs) because brain trauma is is hard. Mm. Yeah. Triggers are hard. Yeah, I found I've had uh, vets come and talk to me, you know, on the Mm -hmm. ambulance. And I, by no means do I, I do not understand what it is to get shot at because I've never been on a battlefield, but they open up and start talking to me. And I think they do that because we do have some things in common, Yeah. but more than that, it's not a story. And so many times you talk to people like the, you talk to a paramedic, what's the worst thing you ever saw? Well, I'm like, well, 
depends on the person, dead mm-hmm. children or your know, dead friends or what do you want? Or, yeah. you know, somebody, you know, selling somebody, I mean, pick your choice, which one's worse to you. Mm-hmm. And it's, so it's not just a story. This is my life. It's what I am. And the same thing with those veterans that see bad stuff. It isn't, so when they talk to me, I'm not like going, oh, that's a good story. No, I understand it's actually part of who they are. And I think that's why they start opening them up. I had one guy, he, he was in uh, Iraq, and it were, he said he was going down a, a road, and his buddy got shot and fell in the Humvee, and so he was up there shooting, and then he just stopped talking. And I said... Are you hearing your the blood on your feet being stuck to the metal floor? He's like, yeah. Wow. How do you know that? I said, because it happens in the ambulance. Because you walk around and he's like, oh. Wow. So it's stuff like that that's why. and Because it, it wasn't just a story yeah. that he was telling me. He understood then that I knew what he meant. Yeah. You'd been He'd, there. Kind of, but not, yeah. yeah. Not there. Yeah. But, but you could understand where his mind was. Mm-hmm. And it's so complex. It's such a complex thing. And if you haven't experienced it, it can be really difficult to communicate how visceral it is. Yeah. yeah all the, you hear it, you see it, you smell it. And every time you hear that same kind of sound, you're like, oh. Or, yeah, sure. Until you accept it. I guess that's really the biggest part about trauma. You accept that it happened. And that's far easier said than done. Oh, absolutely. Very much so. So anecdotally, what is, you know, after being in this profession for so long, what is something or what are things that like you would never do after working in the field that you did for so long as like an emergency responder? Oh, just in general things I wouldn't do? Yeah, like just things that that people... (laughs) Okay, thank you. <laughs> Cocaine? No, that's, it's all bad. No, no, no. Like, everyday things. Are there things that, like, we do as, like, the general public without this knowledge that just is kind of like, that's really stupid. Why would, like, if you knew what I knew, I wouldn't, no. you wouldn't be doing that. No? No, nah, death's coming for you. One way or the <laughs> other. It's just a matter of when and where. Okay. That's a big lesson I learned. Yeah. I body bag people that. Fell down and hit their head, just tripped, because they ate ravioli, because they had a banana, minor stuff that, or people that just fell out of a chair. Hmm. People only think they're in danger when they see something close, like, oh, well, that car got close to me. So I'm like, oh, it scared Hmm. you. Every time you eat, it's just as dangerous as that car was, because that's why everyone's taught, you know, have the Heimlich. If choking wasn't a big deal, we wouldn't teach people how to stop choking but no one ever thinks about that so like uh eat your peanut you know (laughs) yeah just just remember that if you get it down without choking to death it wasn't that's a victory (laughs) yeah now that's a very interesting perspective yeah i i do appreciate that like pretty much anything you're could really kill staring you. at the peanuts now <laughs> <laughs> my computer's blocking them so i'm just gonna leave them alone forever <laughs> no more peanuts <laughs> no that that's that's very very interesting perspective but i <laughs> i do appreciate yes don't do meth or cocaine yeah. thank <laughs> you <laughs> you know yeah because see I, i've seen enough things on the ambulance that i should have died but i didn't yeah and you know other people should have died and they didn't so, yeah, it's all about whether or not God's ready to take you home. Yeah. And that is a big thing that helped me out on the ambulance, too, is knowing that I don't save lives. God saves lives. Mm-hmm. He just lets me. He lets me save the ones he wants to stay, and he takes the rest. Yeah. That was an important realization for me. Do you think you have a just a different a different perspective about death because of how how much in proximity you've been to it oh yeah and almost like a desensitization to it yeah yeah without a doubt i've seen way too much of it of people i've known all my life to where if i see people that i don't know it doesn't i feel nothing Hmm. i not in a mean way i mean I never feel bad for people that die. Even if I know you, I don't feel bad about it. I feel bad for the loved ones. 
Mm. Those are the ones that, because if you're dead, there's nothing I can do for you. If you're alive, then there's something I can do for you. So I guess that's kind of the way I look at death now. Sure. Because the worst pain I ever seen was when I had to tell a mom or son's dead or daughter. Mm -hmm. That's, that's horrible. Yeah. And that bothers me. Putting that kid in a body bag doesn't bother me. Looking the mom in the eye and telling her that. Yeah. That rips me open. Wow. That's a very interesting distinction, but I think important to acknowledge. Yeah. Cause that's. Cause at a certain point it just becomes about the motion, right? Mm-hmm. To, for the, the person that's actually dead, mm-hmm. but the person that's living in their stead is now affected in a way that their lives are changed forever. Yep. Yeah. I guess that's the way it is. Yeah. Mm. So are you glad to be kind of moved on from that season in your life? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Quick answer. Yeah. No, There's hesitation. no hesitation there, none. <laughs> I'm very grateful for for doing it. And yeah. I understand why God had me do it now. Because it it affects my outlook on everything. Yeah. Coming mean, completely changes my viewpoint really from most people's viewpoints. And that's why he did it. I think it prepared me to be a missionary Mm. in a lot better sense of not judging, learning not to judge going through EMS, even though that first part of, you know, with the the druggies and whatnot. But when I got back to church, it's learning some of that. I still don't agree if you're just going to church because you're trying to get free stuff. No. (laughs) But I think that's a righteous anchor. Yeah, everything I learned, the way I look, stuff's different. And it is so I can go out and be a better missionary. Because mm-hmm. you go to a different culture, you have to understand there's more than one way of doing something. Yeah. And uh, EMS taught me that in a lot of ways. I mean, and then dealing with different people's emotions in different ways. Because, yeah. Uh, if I'm in Papua New Guinea and someone dies or gets hurt, I mean, they have totally different uh, realm of emotions than if, say, I'm here in Romania. Yeah. And before, I would have only looked at it from an American point of view. And now, what, seeing enough people's reactions in different ways, I'm more open to, okay, this is how you do it. It's all right. And this is how you do it. It's all right. Yeah. In certain things. Sure. Sure. Not everything's universal. No, no. (laughs) No. Uh, I was getting pretty new agey sounding right there. So I wanted to. (laughs) You're fine. (laughs) But no, I I think it is, you know, your past experiences should inform your your future and your present and your future. And you should be able to apply what you've gone through and what you've learned through your life. I feel like that's when you know you're doing it right. You're learning as you grow and, and move forward. So, yeah. That's why so many people, I never understood why someone would say, well, if I would have known this, I wouldn't have done that. Hmm. Well, that's that's horrible. (laughs) Because if you would have, if you wouldn't have done that, you wouldn't have known this to tell yourself you didn't know that. Well, that's true. It is a very circular argument there. Well, it's to the point that if you change your past, you effectively commit suicide to your present. And that's, that's horrible. I mean, you want to use that past experiences. So you... Changing them is just always a horrible thing. Hmm. That I, and I don't understand why people want to do that. That doesn't make sense to me. Because <laughs> to me, uh, kind of like a, the greatest gift God gave us was Jesus. The second greatest gift God gave us was trouble, was the, the pain and suffering. And it's a lot of people don't grasp that concept. But it's because of trouble, pain, suffering, however, you, you learn what is beautiful mm-hmm. in life. You learn how uh, blessed you are and to appreciate it. Because it. But if you never had the other stuff, you never would be able to do any of that. It's uh, like I came to Romania and they took me out to a Roma village and they're like, see how poor these people are. And I'm like, they're not poor. They are compared to American standards. They are compared to other people's standards in like, inside a city or whatnot. But in Papua New Guinea, they had a tribe that they accepted Jesus. 
And they asked him, what do you think heaven's going to be like? So they went out and they talked for a long time. Now these people live in grass huts. They can't afford shoes. They have one pair of shorts. And I mean, that's it. I mean, you're rich if you have like two or three shirts, Mm -hmm. you know. And they came in and the missionary said, okay, so what do you think heaven's going to be like? They said, everybody has a tin roof. That's their idea. Heaven, not running water, not, not plumbing, nothing, just a tin roof. And then I come here and they say, okay, these people are poor. I'm like, they live in a something that these other people can't even fathom. That they're living in better than what their heaven is. Hmm. It's perspective. Sure. Yeah, perspective is definitely important. So it sounds like you really love what you're doing now and you're thriving. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never know what's coming next. Yeah. So what do you... Well, after that comment, what do you, what do you want to happen next? What are you, what are your dreams for what's next for you? Is there anywhere you'd like to go? Would you like to go back to Papua New Guinea? I'd like to. Yeah. Cause I really miss it. Do you see yourself settling in one place? No, no. And it's kind of like when I go home, I can't leave America faster, fast enough. It's, it's not home anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, mm-hmm. When I lived in Papua New Guinea, I'd go out in the jungle and come back, and then I'd be at my house that I had on a, in an area, and I'm like, oh, I'm home. I'm like, I felt home. In Romania, I come back to Romania, and I have that, I feel home. Mm-hmm. And then I go to the States, I'm like, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I've learned that home is wherever God has me. And if it's back to Papua New Guinea, I'll be happy. If he doesn't send me there and I just go, It'll be just like if I'm going back to the States going, yeah, I don't belong here. I Mm. don't belong here. So you're kind of just waiting for your next assignment. Assignment. There you go. Yeah. Wherever that is. I'd like to go to every continent. I've been on three now, but I'd like to go to every continent, build something for God. Very cool. I don't know what I'd do in Antarctica. (laughs) I was just going to ask you. (laughs) Maybe build a little cross out of the ice. I don't know. Say, all right. (laughs) Mission accomplished. Yep. Get back uh, on the boat and come home. <laughs> okay, so I do have a question that I ask everybody, mm-hmm. which is, through the lens of your experience, what does compassion mean to you? Caring more about someone else than yourself, which I compassion love, but that's it. And it's more towards your soul than your physical needs. Because I've found that stuff doesn't mean anything. It has no value whatsoever. You're merely holding on to something until you can give it to someone else. But loving someone enough to tell them about Jesus, that's compassion. Because you're taking care of something that's eternal. That will carry on. That actually matters. Because the Bible says, build your treasures in heaven, not on earth. And that's what you're doing there. That'd be my compassion. Awesome. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening to The Human Experience. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with others, and leave a rating and review on your favorite platform. Everyone has a story, and I'd love to hear yours. So be sure to check out the show notes for more information about how to stay in touch. Do good and take care.